All right. Well, good morning, uh, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Barry Butler. I'm the Director of Government Relations here for the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance. And uh, these are uh, a series of uh, interviews that we're doing because, you know, we've got uh, at least uh, seven total districts, uh, three state Senate districts and four House of Delegate districts that touch on the Lynchburg region. And, uh, you know, we spoke uh, briefly when I first reached out to you and and I think you caught you by surprise that uh, the uh, the new Senate uh, District 11 uh, touches on our area, which includes Amherst County, and that's in our footprint. So again, I want to thank you for participating in this. And, uh, you know, again, well, wish you the best of luck. Um, and uh, anyways, but again, we sent out questions that we're going to use, uh, you know, for all of our candidate interviews, uh, prepared questions. We won't deviate from them. And the one thing we asked is that uh, the candidates look at them and be prepared to answer uh, from that list of questions. And uh, you did, in fact, get those, correct? Uh, yes, you, you sent via email. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, we're going to do this. It'll be about 30 minutes. Uh, and, you know, we want to try and uh, respect your time and, and uh, try and get through as many as possible, uh, but not expecting to get through all of them. So um, and so, again, uh, Director of Government Relations here at the Alliance and uh, Scott, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks, Barry. Phil, thank you for being on with us. <clears throat> uh, I'm Scott Kowalski. I'm an attorney with PLDR Law here in Lynchburg, and I am chair of the LRBA Government Relations Committee, and uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, ask Mr. Hamilton some questions as we uh, get through the morning. So thanks for being on. Okay. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and uh, Mr. Hamilton, uh, you, know, the, you know, the first two questions we're definitely going to ask, you know, introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your professional experience, and your connection to your district that you're running for office. Yes, well, you're you're certainly interested in the professional part, so I, I totally get that, you know. <laughs> but yeah. if, we, if we want to go way, way back, uh, you know, actually, I started working even when I was in uh, high school. Um, I made signs and and flyers, and I was giving out to my neighbors saying, "Offering to clean their houses, do yard work, uh, cut trees, mow their lawns." So, uh, you know, I I was an entrepreneur from an early age. And I remember at the age of 14 getting a work permit so I could uh, work at a couple of places. One was Toy Corner, another one was Baskin Robbins. So I, I worked with my identical twin brother and my older brother at the same exact uh, Baskin Robbins location in Vienna, Virginia. And uh, it, it was funny because folks thought that we were triplets when I, was, well, I had to explain to them, well, I'm a twin, but that's my older brother. He's not my triplet. <laughs> But well, I'm one of seven yeah. children. Yeah. So my, my parents said, well, we can't afford to give you an allowance. So if you want to go to the movies, if you want to go out with your friends, you got to earn that money. And uh, that entrepreneurial spirit was really driven into me at an early age. And, uh, you know, but growing up, um, <clears throat> you know, I went to James Madison High School. I went to George Mason University. I'm actually a relative of George Mason on my mother's side of the family. And he's the author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights that the First Amendment is based off of, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. Uh, he also co-authored the Fairfax Resolves with George Washington, our first president. So we have a very proud family history and I'm proud to be related to one of the founding fathers. And um, you know, I, I run a history website, hamiltonhistoricalrecords.com. I don't make any money off that website. <laughs> However, you know, I've been doing it for over six years. You know, I've written about various presidential homes, uh, national parks, state parks, museums, Civil War battlefield sites, Revolution War battlefield sites, you name it. I've, I've traveled around the 43 states and written plenty of articles. And uh, I've met with various icons as well, including, including uh, Clarence Benjamin Jones, a former speechwriter and attorney for Martin Luther King Jr. I got to meet him. Uh, five years ago, back in 2018, in uh, East Palo Alto, before it was the day before the 50 year anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination. And uh, I got to meet um, a granddaughter of Gandhi in uh, Scotts Valley, California. 
and uh, uh, the sister of Cesar Chavez, who was a farmer's rights activist in California. So when I was starting the website, I was actually living in California. That's why I got to meet all those folks on the West Coast. Um, so really fascinating journey. And, and another thing I'll add to that, too, is that uh, <clears throat> when I was in high school, I was part of this World War II project. And uh, all these folks that we're interviewing were going to be sent to the National Archives. And uh, I was worked with a couple of my classmates, and we interviewed a German couple who were bombed in Bremen during World War II, a uh, Japanese-American who was taken from his home in Sacramento, Sacramento, California, and interned in Topaz, Utah, and a, a Navy frogman, which is a predecessor of the Navy SEALs. So we got perspectives from different points of the war, and uh, it, it's in the National Archives, so future researchers can, can see those videos. So very proud of doing that. Uh, <clears throat> but right now I actually work as a paralegal. Um, I've been running Hamilton Legal Services for over five years. Uh, so I work as a uh, process server. I do court research, I do court filings uh, for attorneys and other clients uh, throughout Central Virginia and beyond. Uh, I also work for a hedge fund manager. This is actually a new job I started last month. Uh, so I'm working as a legal assistant and <clears throat> as an executive assistant. And uh, it's very interesting because we're dealing with laws in the Virgin Islands and, um, uh, you know, which is a U.S. territory. Mm -hmm. And how if you have financial accounts out there, what laws Congress has passed in relation to them. Um, and we're dealing with like evictions because they, they have a bunch of properties and, um, you know, renting, you know, rental contracts, you name it, things like that. So it's it's a big learning curve because it's first time working for a hedge fund. <laughs> there you go. And uh, yeah. And, so what is your <clears throat> what's your connection to the district? So my connection to <clears throat> the 11th Senate District is you know I live in Charlottesville, uh, <clears throat> you know, and uh, I did live in the city, but I moved to Albemarle County, so I'm now just a couple miles from the city border. <clears throat> And uh, the 11th Senate District covers a wide area. I mean, it goes from Almar County to Louisa, Zion Crossroads, Green Springs, Pavilion Stations, Nelson County, as well as Amherst County. And it's changed from the 25th District, which used to consist of Allegheny County and Bath County with a combined population of 20,000 individuals. Uh, so those two counties have been removed. Amherst County and Louisa have been um, added. Uh, but I'm a proud resident of Charlottesville. You know, I, I love living here. You know, we're we're close to multiple presidential homes. Uh, I've been to Monticello several times over the past decade. Uh, I've visited Montpelier, uh, out in Orange, <clears throat> uh, Monroe's, um, Ashland Highland, which is also in Charlottesville. And there's another presidential home, a third one in Albemarle County that uh, a lot of folks don't know exists. But it's uh, Theodore Roosevelt's. Pine Knot. It was a cabin, vacation cabin, but it's in the southern part of the county near Scottsville. So if you haven't seen it, recommend checking that out. All right. Just to pick and up the pace a little bit, but, uh, right. you know, the next question in that very top, you know, portion that we sent, uh, thinking about the district if elected, uh, what, is, what are going to be your legislative priorities when you get to the General Assembly? Well, if I'm elected, you know, one of my top priorities is, is getting term limits in place. I think, you know, we need to put a stop to the career politicians that we have. You know, I don't believe that my relative George Mason and other founding fathers uh, believed in people being in office for several decades. I mean, George Washington limited himself to just eight years as president. He didn't want to be a king. And uh, I want to be reminiscent of that. And I support term limits, not just for the governor, but for Senate House of Delegates, school board, mayor, board of supervisors, let's have a trickle down effect and let's amend the Virginia Constitution uh, with the term limits amendment. So that's uh, definitely a top priority for me. But my other top priorities are lowering taxes uh, for residences and for businesses throughout the Commonwealth. You know, we have a $3.6 billion budget surplus. I mean, that's massive. And, and compared to California, California is in the red over a billion dollars so thankfully we're in a state that's not running a huge deficit but this is the people's money and i think we need to give the money back to the people and 
especially at a time that we're experiencing historic levels of inflation, not seen since the days of Jimmy Carter. And uh, people are suffering. I, I talked to a lot of folks who are lower middle class, and they said, you know, we can't afford to go on a family vacation. Uh, you know, the gasoline prices, you know, food prices uh, have, have really uh, eaten our budget. And uh, you know, a lot of folks, you know, they've had to do with less. They have less disposable income. And I think if we can lower the tax burden, uh, people are going to be uh, uh, thankful for that. And there's even moderate Democrats who are saying, I think taxes are too high right now because not only is the state tax in them, but the property assessments in Almar County have jumped over 18 percent in the past two years. So there's Democrats who are thinking twice about the tax rate. So. Um, what, uh, Mr. Hamilton, in addition to uh, term limits and taxes, do you have any other priorities uh, if you were to make it to the General Assembly? Yes, yes. Uh, another one is uh, passing SAGE's law, and that is to require parental notification if a child uh, goes by a different gender than one assigned to them at birth. Uh, I think that parents' rights do matter, and Governor Youngkin's been saying that uh, on many occasions. That's why he defeated Terry McCall a couple of years ago because he does believe that. Uh, another thing I believe is that we need to get SRO, which is school resource officers, mandated in every school district throughout the Commonwealth. And the reason um, I'm pushing for this is because the defund the police movement has pushed for the removal of these armed officers in our schools. And that puts our children at risk of, you know, if there's a madman or, or you know, uh, uh, other folks who come in and want to shoot up a school, then there's no layers of protection for those children. And we have to mandate the SRO officers and we got to make it a funded mandate. So if a rural uh, school district doesn't have the money to hire them, let's take money from the general fund to finance that mandate. Okay. And gotcha. Well, Mr. Harold, that's a great segue into our first category right. we'd like to hit on, which is education and workforce, which is a, one of the uh, priorities for the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance and our uh, 600 and some, some odd members. Uh, an educated and prepared workforce is crucial to our business, thriving business community, as you know. So the first uh, first question out of the box on the education piece, uh, thinking about K through 12 education specifically uh, and addressing the attraction and retention of public school teachers, what are the, some of the things that you think that General Assembly can do uh, to incentivize folks to move into the teaching profession and keep them there once once they're uh, on board? Well, that's a great uh, question. <clears throat> and I, I believe that teachers are underpaid. I think we do need to increase their pay um, as an incentive uh, to bring more folks on board. And I know the turnover rate is very high right now. And I think you know pay is a huge issue pertaining to that. And <clears throat> I also believe that you know we need to have laws in place like Florida and other states have that prevent the teaching of divisive um, theories like critical race theory. Uh, there are folks who are turned off by that and not really the teachers, but in Albemarle County, there's a crisis of school bus drivers. There's a lack of them and a lot of students are walking the school and you have the superintendent, Matthew Haas, who's doing a morning shift driving um, school buses. And what is the superintendent doing? Uh, uh, but it's because they're teaching CRT, it's part of the training, and there's folks who don't want to become um, school bus drivers because of that. But also, they have CRT in the training required for teachers in this county and some other counties throughout Virginia, and I think that's also turning some folks away from the profession. And uh, I, I will explore ways that we can root that out um, of these uh, uh, of those required trainings. Gotcha. And and moving on from the teacher teaching aspect, uh, moving on to the students, uh, what are some of the things that you think that the General Assembly can do, if anything, to improve the literacy and math proficiency for the children uh, in the public school system in your district? Well, <clears throat> what we need to do is, you know, we need to pass uh, school choice, um, hands down. And I think if we have increased competition between the private schools, the home schools, and the public schools, that will really cause the public schools to elevate their standards. And they say, if they want to retain these students uh, and compete with these public schools and realize that we're going to give out vouchers, allowing parents 
to take students away from public schools into uh, private schools. I think, you know, if school choice were passed, then there would be a, a, a curriculum reevaluation and they would uh, uh, increase the standards so that way they can compete with these private schools. And I, I think that that would be the way we can force their hand. Gotcha. So competition, that sounds uh, uh, sounds like one plan. All right. How about um, the taxpayer dollars? You were mentioning taxes earlier. Um, how could the Commonwealth of Virginia invest taxpayer dollars more efficiently or appropriately in the K through 12 education system with the goal of creating uh, a talented, skilled and well-trained workforce? Well, we have <clears throat> in uh, Charlottesville specifically, we have what's called lab schools. And I think it's, it's actually a great use of our taxpayer dollars because we're having these high level classes being taught um, at those schools and in, in science and mathematics, uh, biology and, and other subjects. And uh, I, I would love to see more lab schools throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, I think uh, you know, uh, that's the way we can acknowledge and uh, show appreciation for higher learners. And uh, we also have in Northern Virginia, the Thomas Jefferson School, and, and a lot of elite students are, uh, are going over there. And, you know, there, there's other, um, you know, <clears throat> schools uh, uh, for children as well. But um, I think we need to invest in these schools that encourage um, higher rates of learning, um, that, that have tough classes, uh, well-learned uh, teachers. Um, and, you know, I'm in full support of that. Well, right. Mr. Um, so did, oh, go ahead, Barry. Yeah, I was going to, we're running a little short on time, so I want to jump around a little bit, but uh, one last question on uh, education and workforce. Um, you know, obviously, uh, there's been a, um, you know, uh, over, the, over a number of years, uh, pushing kids to go to four-year colleges and universities, obviously, and that's uh, created some challenges, um, especially in our workforce. Uh, how can we provide additional support to school counselors and teachers to present all possible pathways uh, that includes college track and also skilled trades? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, <clears throat> I remember when I was at James Madison High School, um, I got to meet with my college counselor and uh, they recommended various public and private universities throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, but one thing they didn't mention was skill trade. And uh, I thought, you know, that was a direction I wanted to uh, go in. Um, I was at a disadvantage because that wasn't being presented to me. And I would certainly explore, um, you know, legislation that will require, well, in addition to public and private universities, uh, for counselors to also recommend, recommend uh, skill trade uh, schools for students. And the thing is, those are opportunities I may have not even known I wanted to pursue if I wanted to go that direction. And I think there's many other students that, that feel that way as well. Yeah. Um, right. So that's uh, that's a uh, a good segue into an, another area that we uh, another category, military and veterans affairs yep. uh, in terms of um, career technical education. Uh, it's not not just in your district, but throughout the Commonwealth. Um, what are some ways the Commonwealth of Virginia can uh, take all of these uh, military folks from throughout the, the Commonwealth that are stationed here and encourage them to stay in the Commonwealth, utilize the skills that they've uh, obtained in the military uh, and stay here and become a productive member of, uh, of Virginia? Well, one of the things I want to do is if we do get this SRO mandate passed, I would like to uh, incentivize veterans to stay in the Commonwealth of Virginia and to work as security officers at our, our public schools and to have programs and you know brochures saying, you know, we, we're supporting veterans, work as an SOR officer, serve your community. I think that's that's certainly one way we can keep them here. Uh, you know, we have various military academies. You know, VMI, uh, the Fork Union Military Academy, which is just down the road in, in Fluvanna, um, the Augusta Military Academy. You know, I, I certainly encourage our veterans uh, to teach the next generation, um, uh, you know, military discipline um, and, uh, you know, the, the meaning of the service, you know, 
And I think it, that definitely gives a pass down to um, to the younger generation. What about um, offering additional training, Mr. Hamilton, to these uh, to, to get them on a pathway to uh, being a productive member of society to the extent they hadn't already get, gotten the training? Yeah, because there are some folks who join the military that it, right at eight, age of 18, um, they they skip college, they're not entering the workforce, they just go straight in the military and they come out. So we definitely need to explore ways and programs um, to transition them into civilian life so that way they can work. Uh, so I'm open uh, to having programs for them to make that transition. Mm -hmm. So let's oh, let's move on to right. you know let's move on to a couple of other things. Um, we've got uh, a little less than ten minutes, but uh, housing and child care, and you know I I've, I've got you know people I'm connected to up in the Charlottesville area, but this is also um, you know throughout the Commonwealth. But uh, rising cost and availability of child child care is impacting the available work, uh, labor force, leaving many families struggling to find affordable child care. Are deciding to work, uh, leave the workforce to stay home with their children. Uh, do you think the state has a role to play in solving this problem? And what are some ways the state can help address the issue in your district? Well, in Charlottesville, particularly, they just voted back in May to uh, give five million more dollars to the affordable uh, housing fund, and and that doesn't automatically go to affordable housing uh, entities. They have to apply for grants and they have grant writers that um, that make those requests. And then they allocate that money to those organizations like the Charlottesville Affordable Housing Fund um, and, and other groups. And uh, they have to report back saying how that money is spent. But on the state level, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, uh, in support uh, generally of affordable housing products. because I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative. I think that we need to lower taxes rather than throwing money at the problem. If if we can lower the tax burden, then that's going to make our cost of living uh, less expensive, which translates to making housing uh, more affordable for them. But if localities want to go in and fund for affordable housing, then that's up to locality to make that decision. Okay. Um, moving on to business climate. Um, and this is just a general question. Uh, this, you know, what are some additional ways the Commonwealth of Virginia can support economic development initiatives that improve the availability of pad ready sites, create jobs and strengthen trade? Well, <clears throat> I believe that, you know, we need, um, you know, be competitive with other states. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's, you know, I have some folks who, you know, who I know who've gotten out of school. They worked as engineers, um, as architects. Um, in order to, you know, uh, improve, uh, um, you know, uh, building, you know, in, in Virginia, um, I think we need to reduce the cost of building permits. So that way, you know, building not just homes, but new business complexes, new shopping malls and, and other, uh, uh, business entities is more affordable. And we also need to get the, the level of bureaucracy reduced. Uh, which will also help reduce the building costs and encourage more of these folks, you know, to to work in that field here in the state of Virginia. Okay. You mentioned that uh, you know, at the outset, ta lowering taxes is one of your priorities. Uh, at the same time, in order to be competitive with uh, either our neighboring states or other states across the Southeast, which are getting a lot of uh, new business moving in from overseas and around the country, uh, the, the item that, that Barry mentioned, the Pad Ready site, issue is paramount to these folks that are coming and visiting the Lynchburg region. Would you support investing dollars from the Commonwealth, from the general fund or otherwise, uh, to create pad ready sites across the Commonwealth? Okay, repeat the last part of the question again. So pad ready sites, if you have an understanding of what that term means, that means that the site has been cleared. Uh, we have the infrastructure in place for utilities and otherwise, uh, and ready to begin putting in a pad and putting in a building or either a manufacturing or other type of business complex, having the dollars in order to have those sites ready for these uh, these organizations that are looking for new homes or expansion uh, has been a paramount issue to the folks coming through the Lynchburg region. And the lack of those pad ready sites has hurt us significantly. Would you support the Commonwealth's expending taxpayer dollars to create pad ready sites across the Commonwealth? 
Yes, I, I'd certainly be open to that. And, uh, and just for clarification, uh, I know the, the training center, which has been vacant for a couple of years in Amherst County, I looked at the, the development plan for that. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, we should revitalize that area um, instead of just leaving it as a dormant building. So, yes, I am in support of that. Okay. Um, one last question, and then I want, you know, circling back to um, taxes, because you've, uh, you know, made your position very clear that lowering taxes is uh, key to um, competitiveness and uh, also um, putting more money back in uh, just that, you know, the average citizen's uh, pocket. Um, expanding on that a little bit, how can the General Assembly target tax reform to better position the state for economic growth and investment? Great. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, my opponent, Senator Deeds, he has uh, opposed uh, any tax cuts. He says that tax cuts are irresponsible. So, you know, if you vote for him, you're not going to get it uh, from him at all. Uh, but I'm going to explore like lowering the sales tax. Uh, if, if we do that, uh, then more people will be purchasing goods in our Commonwealth. It's going to help small businesses because then more people will be spending their disposable income on buying uh, uh, various goods from their, their local farmers markets, from their local businesses um, uh, in the area. And it, it really helps, you know, the um, everyone all around. It's going to help create more jobs, et cetera. Uh, but we also need to explore, you know, cutting other taxes like the gasoline tax. The, you know, the cost of goods has increased because of the, the cost of transporting those goods. And I met with various truckers and, you know, a lot more money comes out of their pocket just to fill up these uh, uh, big semis. And uh, down the road, you know, uh, give comes, you know, uh, comes a shove and they got to increase the cost of, of these goods for folks. So if we have a permanent, not a temporary gasoline tax cut. I think that'll be a great uh, benefit to our Commonwealth. And the Democrats in the Senate, they voted against even a temporary tax relief a few months ago. And uh, if we flip the Senate Republican, we will vote for a permanent gas tax relief for the Commonwealth. Okay. Gotcha. Well, Mr. Hamilton, we're approaching the end of our half hour. I want to give you an opportunity to, to, to wrap things up and, uh, uh, and, and give anybody some insight into your... Uh, your goals if you uh, were to get elected? Absolutely. Well, if I'm elected and if we're able to flip the Senate, which is crucial, we're going to have a, a significantly different vision for Virginia. You now, Governor Yunkin, um, you know, he believes that parents matter, and I do as well. And we're going to uh, fight for our children in our schools. We're going to uh, fight for the unborn because uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Baptist, and I believe that unborn lives do matter. And I will uh, push for legislation that will give greater protections for the unborn. I also believe, uh, you know, as I said earlier, term limits, that's going to be a top priority for me. We'll, we'll, we got to get that passed. And I'm going to convince my colleagues in the Senate and my colleagues in the House of Delegates that this is what the people want, uh, including independents and even some Democrats. And uh, I'm, I'm encouraged. I ran for the House of Delegates two years ago in the former 57th district, which was just Charlottesville City. But as a candidate for Virginia Senate, I'm covering four counties. And I'm really encouraged by all the support I've been getting. Uh, I really want to thank all the volunteers who've been helping out in this race. And early voting is less than two weeks away. So I'm encouraging folks to, to get out, to, to vote early, to uh, request an absentee ballot if they have to, or the vote on election day. But with grassroots support, we will be able to defeat a 31-year incumbent who's been in the General Assembly uh, for a very long time. And uh, I will present a new vision for Virginia, and I thank you all for having me here today. Uh, and uh, again, uh, if anyone who's watching this video can go to hamiltonforvasenate.com. Well, excellent. Look, thank you so much, Mr. Hamilton. Um, you know, the goal for us is, uh, you know, for all the candidates, uh, we want to have uh, all the, you know, your information that you sent us. Uh, we're also going to post the list of questions that um, that we uh, sent to every candidate. They're all identical. And uh, and again, you do have the opportunity if you want to expand on any of these questions, uh, you know, to send that in and we'll post it and you'll and that will be made available to our members. But then also, 
the public has access to that. And so they'll be able to have access to this uh, interview video as well. So, uh, and we're to do that. Um, our goal is to do that by the time that early voting starts so that everybody has, you know, more than enough time to consider, you know, their choices, uh, you know, within their districts. So.